All right, so the questions are, what is PARP anyway? How does it work? Basic science of synthetic lethal mutations. And does it matter in the clinic? And what about prostate cancer? So this is a, a really interesting uh, story. So most of you know in the, in the last 20 years or so, we've had tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And they add phosphate groups to tyrosine on proteins that makes a negative charge and some function on the protein and dimerization can occur and so forth. Well, it turns out that poly-ADP ribose polymerase, PARP inhibitors, kind of do the same thing, except they are adding negative charges as phosphate groups rather than just a single phosphate. And there's a target protein, and it can be histones in DNA, or for example, uh, diphtheria toxin A chain, ADP ribosylates elongation factor two, and that's been an area of interest of mine, but the key thing to remember is how, how potent this can be. So this one enzyme, uh, ADP ribosylation, a single molecule of diphtheria toxin can kill a cell. So this can be a very potent effect. But you can start adding more and more chains and eventually get more and more negative charges, and that can affect the histone interaction uh, and, and uh, recruit other uh, function uh, proteins to DNA repair areas. So this is called parlation, and it's negative charges leading to structural changes in proteins. So that's how PARP works. Now, in the, in the situation of using it in cancer therapy, and we're going to talk a lot about BRCA1 and 2 in a little bit here, uh, the first uh, thing we want to go through is synthetic lethality. And this means that you have, let's say this is BRCA1 or 2, and it does not cause cell death, but it does lead to cancer because you get mutations. If you had another mutation in a DNA repair pathway, the cell could still survive. But if you uh, get both of these uh, mutated uh, or knocked out, in the case of this is BRCA1 and now you add a PARP inhibitor, it leads to cell death. So this is how that looks. You have some patient with a on any of a number of DNA repair pathways, and we'll look at those in a second, and they have mutations because they have this intrinsic germline or somatic, the tumor has developed a mutation in DNA repair, and this is PARP, and it, it has zinc fingers that can recognize a single strand break and attach to the histones associated with this protein and begin doing its enzymatic thing First thing that happens is it refolds itself, et cetera, and brings in the catalytic domain to start doing this parlation that we just talked about, using NAD as the substrate and adding ADP riboses to this. And that recruits other factors, and you start getting repair of the DNA. The PARP1 inhibitors actually trap this so that it, you can't go through this pathway and re-establish uh, the uninhibited PARP. So the PARP inhibitors sort of trap this in this configuration, and it kind of adds the second mutation that leads to cell death. So that's how PARP inhibitors work. This happens to be a superb article from last year uh, by these two people in, in science. But it's, it's really well written, so even I could understand it. So how does this relate to cancer in general and prostate cancer in particular? Well, we all know that there's lots of mutations that occur in all cancers, and they, ha they can be characterized as repair pathways, or as, as double strand breaks rather, insertions, deletions, different types of damage with different types of repair pathways. And base excision repair is where you take out the base that's mutated and, and put a new one in. The double strand mutations can occur after a single strand mutation if you don't repair things. So this is a, a nasty thing that starts happening, and there are a whole series of genes related to DNA repair. And if you have germline mutations in any of these genes, you're at increased risk. And I found this to be uh, incredibly interesting. So they, they've looked at, in this New England Journal article uh, published two years ago, 692 men with metastatic prostate cancer, and 12% of those had germline mutations, as opposed to only 5% or so with localized prostate cancer. So this means that these people with germline mutations who develop prostate cancer, their cancer is worse and metastasizes more early. You're walking around with 53,000 people looked at and 2.7% of us have a germline mutation 
in one of these many DNA repair pathways. So the PARP inhibitors were developed, as I showed you, to interrupt this pathway. Here's the simple version of what we just looked at, the normal PARP1 function, single strand break. You have parlation events that lead to repair. The PARP inhibitors prevent that repair. And a number of inhibitors, small molecules, have been developed that work this way. And we will look at Olaparib as the one that's uh, been looked at mostly in prostate cancer, but they have different levels of PARP trapping potency, and all of them are being looked at in prostate cancer and have been looked at and approved in some of the other cancers we'll look at. So this TOPARP study had 49 patients with metastatic prostate cancer who had been treated with at least one of the second generation hormones, hormone blockers uh, that you've heard about, and uh, were also docetaxel pretreated. They then had, uh, they treated everybody in these unselected patients, but looked at, in retrospect, what the tumors had in the way of DNA repair mutations. So their genomic analysis of their prospectively obtained tumor samples, 16 of the patients had mutations in the DNA repair pathway, and 33 had no such mutations. So then you looked at what was the response rate, and 14 of the 16 patients who had the repair pathway mutations responded as opposed to only two of the 33 patients who didn't have these mutations. So this is personalized therapy uh, at its best, and that's why this has generated a lot of excitement. These are the data sort of spread out, and looking up here, this is the uh, radiographic progression-free survival in the patients who had the repair pathway mutation versus the patients who did not, and this is their overall survival. So a substantial difference. And because of this uh, study, uh, Olaparib was granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in 2016. However, as best I can tell, it is still not uh, approved for treatment, so it's probably not covered uh, by third parties. This is the, the different mutations that we looked at in that pie diagram. They were all over the map, and these are the two patients that responded that did not have uh, such repair pathways. So this is uh, the outside of prostate cancer areas of interest. This is an article that was published just a few days ago in pancreas cancer patients. The same sort of uh, analysis is occurring. These are the, the carriers of a DNA repair pathway mutation versus the non-carriers with very significant p-values. This is in metastatic breast cancer where in August of last year, uh, germline BRCA mutation patients are now approved for Oloparib uh, in treating metastatic breast cancer, and this is the same drug in platinum-sensitive relapsed ovarian cancer, where it has been approved, and a recent study showing that you can prolong the survival of platinum pretreated patients uh, in this situation. So the clinical assessment of PARP inhibitor synthetic lethality, which we've talked about, is now important in breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and it's approved in ovarian and breast cancer and substantial fractions of, uh, of these patients uh, have ongoing clinical trials of various sorts. And there have been FDA approvals in a few of the other diseases. So PARP inhibition in prostate cancer has breakthrough uh, designation. It will be, uh, if they go with the usual kind of language, indicated for patients who have metastatic disease who have either BRCA1 or 2 or ATM mutations, either in the tumor or germline, and have received a prior taxane and at least one new hormonal therapy. And this is uh, under expedited review. The dose is 300 milligrams twice a day given orally, and the side effects are fairly significant. Uh, in one of the studies, not in prostate cancer, 11% of patients stop taking it because of toxicity. Fatigue and uh, asthenia in as high as 70% of patients. Nausea is frequent, vomiting less frequent low white counts and anemia, and then rarely this can induce myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myelogenous leukemia, pneumonitis, and fetal harm is expected but hasn't been shown. So there are a number of clinical trials targeting the DNA damage response uh, and being developed with all of those different drugs that I showed you. And this is from uh, Dan Petrolak's uh, slide set. This is Olaparib, the one that is the farthest along in development. And these are uh, different trials that are uh, underway uh, with the NCI designations over here. This is Rucaparib when hormone refractory uh, uh, DNA repair deficient metastatic prostate cancer. And uh, another trial of that, this is another 
uh, inhibitor, and then three more with oliparib in different settings, combining it, because in theory, if you have DNA breaks and then you add this drug to an alkylating agent or even platinum, for example, you should be able to accentuate uh, the activity of this uh, drug combination. So in conclusion, PARP inhibitors, or platinums, have significant activity in patients with a variety of cancers. These responses are much higher with germline or somatic DNA repair mutations, and this brings into uh, clinical use the synthetic lethal interactions that were hypothesized uh, over uh, 50 years ago, and we now have clinical applicability of this approach to treating cancer, and you could combine this with other DNA damaging agents. Testing for DNA repair mutations in germline or tumor tissue is becoming more important. That's going to be covered tomorrow. Uh, when do you do it? How much are the costs of doing that? And then when you do the cost analysis, you have to say what's the benefit of doing this if it costs a fair amount to do the, the analysis of DNA repair mutations, but you save giving patients a drug that's going to be ineffective, you may actually save money by doing the, the repair mutation analysis first. And then there are possible implications for checkpoint inhibitors that I won't go into, but when you have BRCA or ATM mutations, you get a, a phenotype of different mutations downstream from that that indicates what's called BRCA ness. And those patients are the ones that have a, a, a much higher burden of mutations, and that in turn leads in some studies to more mutations more abnormal proteins being released and increased sensitivity to the checkpoint inhibitors, which, as you know, in uh, diseases like melanoma uh, have been dramatic, and we're hoping to get there in prostate cancer one day.